Carl Brown. This is Chris Stockel, our other co-host. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris right now just to tell you a little bit about our show. Chris? Thanks, Carl. The Real Outdoor Experience, uh, we came up with this show. We've watched a lot of hunting, fishing, outdoor shows over the years. And um, they provide a lot of great information. But what uh, us as outdoorsmen we're looking for is a little bit more of the, um, the pre- steps prior to whether you're going out fishing and on the boat on the lake or in your tree stand ready to uh, shoot a deer. We're looking for the, the build-up steps to get that and what our show is hoping to provide is the steps that you can take as a dad looking to take your kids out fishing or looking to go out uh, on a goose hunt uh, by yourself for the first time, the steps that are required and that you take in deciding that you want to take your kid fishing to actually taking your kid out on the lake fishing for whatever species you want to fish. Carl. I tell you, Chris, there's, you know, I, I look for years uh, on, the, on the internet and uh, uh, watching fishing, hunting, camping shows, and I couldn't find exactly what you're talking about. I couldn't find the steps to taking my son ice fishing for the first time. So either you, you know, you, you just go and do it and you muddle through it and maybe you have a successful fish or you can plan and, and get the appropriate information and then you know have a first time experience that's just fantastic for you both. So that's really what our show is about. It's about learning. So it's the instructional piece of the outdoors and it's about watching us muddle our way through it because we are the real outdoor experience. Hi, welcome to today's show. It's about the controlled deer hunt. Chris, where are we starting? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the actual steps from being a first-time deer hunter in the controlled hunt up until what you're going to do with your uh, meat once that you've uh, obtained it. Um, we're going to start, we're going to look at the application process and how you go through that, how you're going to find some land. Uh, then we're going to look at the various techniques uh, through stand hunting, still hunting, you know, hunting out of a tree stand, and then the... Uh, a group uh, dog hunt um, and then we're gonna go to Carlin in the kitchen and uh, have a look at a good recipe so it should be a good show let's go have a look this year you've decided that you're going to add an extra week of deer hunting to your season by participating in the controlled hunt whether as an individual or with a group of your friends it is a great way fun and interesting way to get out and do an additional week of deer hunting what we're going to look at is the application process. Uh, for controlled hunt, you must apply to a specific area and specific season that you wish to hunt and uh, get a tag for this area. Sometimes you do get them, sometimes you don't. It just all depends upon the hundred numbers. So right now, let's take a look at how we go through that procedure. So here we have, we've gone online. We are using the Ministry of Ontario in this case. We're looking at the hunting regulations and we have specifically gone to the regulations for the controlled deer hunt. There's three ways to apply for the hunt. You can apply for the hunt by calling, uh, automated telephone application system. You can apply by going online, or you can apply by going to one of the Service Ontario centers or license issuers. Uh, we're going to have a look at the online application system in a minute. So for an on online application, we'll go to the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources site, because we're using Ontario, for example, here, hunting in Ontario. Uh, we're going to scroll down here to the related links and buy an Ontario license, renew your outdoors card, and enter a big game draw online. That's the one we're looking for. So we're going to click on that. We're going to come to big game draws, and then over here we've got all our info. Um, detailing what we have to do. The periods, our controlled deer hunt is August 1st to September 2nd. September 2nd is the deadline, so that's the important date to remember because if you don't make that, there'll be no deer hunting in the controlled hunt for you this year. Uh, once again, to scroll down, those are the other big game available in Ontario, but once again, we're con concentrating on the controlled deer, a validation tag draw, August 1st to September 2nd, 2014, once you're successful in the draw. Uh, at this point, we can't apply there, but uh, you would click uh, on the control deer hunt and on your way you go. Guess what I got in the mail today? My control deer hunt. I'm going deer hunt. When you get your tag, just verify to make sure all the information is correct, including the WMU you were hunting, the season, 
your name and outdoors card number. Now that we've gotten our tag, back to the computer to start looking for some land hunt. Okay, we've gone to the computer. In this case, we're using Google Earth to do look for some satellite shots. There's other applications out there, MapQuest, that you can use. Right now, uh, we're going to the WMU where we're hunting, and I'm just having a look around for some wood lots to hunt, big or small, whether you're hunting by yourself to put up a tree stand or hunting with a group of guys. Here's a nice little fence line that moves across from one bush lot to the other. So these would be two spots to look for. When searching for property, also be aware of the municipality and the towns in which you are around. Uh, make sure that uh, you are hunting in areas that are designated hunting areas, even though they may be in a, a field or a wood lot. Be sure to check with your local township to make sure you can hunt this area. Well, at the township office, now is the time to find out who owns the property and find out the landowner's information in order to get uh, contact with them to seek permission. Once we have determined who owns the land, we can now visit to ask for permission. I've always liked to do contact face-to-face -face as opposed to a telephone call. It's more personal that way. I usually introduce myself and ask if they allow hunting on their property. If they do, I ask for permission for myself and four of my friends to hunt there during the specific seasons, give them the exact dates and times. If this is good with them, I leave a card with my name and number so they can contact me if there are any problems and thank them. And of course, there are always those that say no. If they say no, thank them and try again next year. You never know. Once I have permission, I try to stop by for a visit asking about crops and how the harvest has been just to keep in touch. By doing this, landowner will begin to know me and the type of person that I am and keep in good standing with them throughout the season. Remember, respect the wishes of the landowners or the land that we have today for hunting may not be available for us tomorrow. If it says no trespassing, do not go on that land unless you have the landowner's permission. Today we're going to talk about the equipment that's required for the shotgun deer hunt. There are many types of equipment that you can buy for a shotgun deer hunt. Your equipment can either make or break the shotgun deer hunt for you, so it's important to choose the appropriate equipment. As I mentioned, the equipment that you use can make or break your hunt. I have some blaze orange clothing here. I use that uh, to satisfy the requirements of the jurisdiction that I hunt in. Uh, check the guidelines for the amount of blaze orange that you require. Uh, down to the ammunition that I use, some buckshot, some slugs. It all depends on the gun that you have and where you're standing. Now it's down to choosing the appropriate shotgun for your deer hunt. Here I have a couple pump action shotguns. One is a camo colored, one is just a regular uh, wood grain with a black matte finish. I also have a couple of semi-auto shotguns. And it really boils down to uh, economy, how much money you can put into the shotgun, and it boils down to preference. GPS is also a useful tool if you hunt a very large area. It can keep you safe in the bush. A sharp knife is very important to have. I have two knives that I carry, one for skinning and one more of a utility type of knife. Some good optics, very nice and handy sometimes when you're glassing areas looking for deer. These can uh, really assist you in many ways. A rangefinder is a great tool so that you understand exactly where you can place a shot this will help you with the efficiency of taking those deer. Some of the creature comforts that you want to consider are some hand warmers and foot warmers. These can make your day nice and comfortable out in the bush. I carry all my equipment in a knapsack. Uh, depending on the knapsack you have or the, the amount of equipment you have, you may want to kind of gauge the size of the knapsack, carry some extra socks, uh, stuff to keep me nice and toasty out in that cold winter's day. And then of course a nice good pair of boots you want a, uh, a boot that's going to suit your environment. If you're in a bush uh, or in terrain that's really, really wet, you may want to go rubber. Or uh, in this case, this is a Gore-Tex uh, high 10-inch boot. Uh, this one is, is probably a multifaceted boot. We've got everything straightened away. It's getting close to uh, opening day. Time to have a look at the weather forecast too, which is very important when it comes to dressing and what you're going to face with whether you choose a ground blind or sitting in a blind, the weather, the wind conditions on your dogs. Very important feature. Let's go back to the computer and have a look. Now in this case we've used the weather network. Things you want to look at are the winds, the wind gusts, the temperatures. We 
get our sunrise time, sunset time, all very important to know before going out the day of. Uh, there's some other stuff that you can look at, just your long term, what you're going to face over the course of the week, which is handy information to know. Hey. Wait a minute. No work today. I'm going hunting. Coffee's brewing. Breakfast is cooking. We're getting closer to getting out in the fields. See ya. Well, the guys are on their way out to their spots right now. Some guys are going into the fields to prepare for standing. Some guys are headed to tree stands for sitting. And me, myself, I'm heading out to the bush lot. I'm going to still hunt through. Good luck. Time to get together and hunt some deer. Meet up with the boys. First off, we're going to have a look at the stand hunt. Basically, anybody can do this as an individual or as a group or as part of your dogging uh, stand. Um, basically what you're looking for is you're looking for a vast expanse that you can see over a cornfield, through fields, um, across meadows, uh, up on ridges. Anything that's going to give you a good view, whether you can shoot within that range or you just observe and see deer moving around through that range. It's, that's the place where you want to be. With stand hunting, we're looking for a vast expanse where we can see a long way as during the shotgun hunt we have a longer shot than we do with the bow season. Nice to have those long viewing areas to get a shot and possibly see where deer are moving into the next possible woodlot. Or you can simply stand and watch over the cornfield. Once again, covering a large area for both shooting and sight. Right now, this is a uh, just a view of what John's got to look forward to. He covers a lot of bush on the east side of the the swamp we hunt, so anything in east-west, a little bit to the north-south, we can see. Positioning is everything. Shotgun hunt, you can reach out. Got more distance than in the bow hunt. And we go around to the back side of John's tree. And you can even see into the uh, field next one over. Secondly, we're going to look at tree stands. These are good, well used for the bow hunters and they can be equally effective with the uh, shotgun hunt too. Uh, get you up, you can see through the woods, it's, uh, it can be a little bit more comfortable. Some people don't like getting up high, you don't necessarily have to be up high. There's store bought stands, homemade stands, there's lots of variety out there so we'll have a look at some of that right now. Here we have our store bought ladder stand, in this case it's a nice big double wide for some guys with big butts to sit in, but they are comfortable and they give you a good vantage point for which you can look, whether you're hunting by yourself in the stand or you're waiting for doggers to come through to push you some deer. There is also the homemade variety, which are just as effective and for a fraction of the cost. We will be right back. Stay tuned. Next, we're gonna look at still hunting. Still hunting is my personal favorite it's me getting into the deer's turf and trying to find them without spooking them out in enough time to get a shot. It's uh, very challenging and I really happen to enjoy it. So we're going to take a look at uh, what we do for that right now. This year we we're fortunate enough to have snow for our controlled hunt. Snow is always a good thing because it leads to tracks and that's what we are looking for. Some of these. We find tracks headed in a particular direction of the bush. It gives a still hunter an idea of what is out there. Occasionally, however, we do find these turkey tracks. Turkey tracks can kind of be somewhat of a nuisance because turkeys make a lot of noise in the bush. And when frightened, they flush. They can also make it sound like they're a deer in the bush. Lots of fun though seeing them. Off into the bush we go. Rifle in hand, always looking left and right, waiting to see that deer that I might get the shot at. As I move through, I try to take three steps and then stop and look and listen. That was important. Stop, look, and listen. Take a few more steps, stop, look, and listen again. If I break a branch or anything to make any kind of noise, I immediately stop, look, and listen. Because that's the battle in this. You have to see the deer before they see you and take off. Once again, you're taking into consideration the wind direction, trying to hunt into the wind as best as you can. 
occasionally you do have forever come into a bush that isn't so nice and is difficult to get through. In which case, being quiet and taking three steps and looking and listening and watching is not going to be working as well. In this case, it's a case of trying to get through the woods in the spot that is going to make the least amount of noise possible in order not to spook deer. But, like I said, sometimes the woods isn't a perfect place to be either. All in all, it is great to be in the woods. In this particular case, I didn't see any deer. And I didn't push any deer out to the fellas. But you know what? I had a great walk going through the woods. Finally, we're going to have a look at the dog hunt. Um, a lot of people don't really like this technique of hunting deer, getting in the bush and pushing them out. The way I do it with the uh, the guys I hunt, we you know surround a bush. We're on the other side of the field, and somebody still hunts through the bush and says the deer. If the deer, if you can't get on the deer and you scare them away, you know it's not at a full run. So this is one of the uh, techniques that uh, is popularly used, and we're going to have a look at. So we're setting up for another push through the bush here. I'm going to go in and find a tree stand. The other guys are going to set up along the perimeter here of this bush. And uh, hopefully we can get the deer to come right to us. Stay tuned. So the beginning of the important ones in the shotgun hunt are the standards. These are the guys that have to sit over prolonged periods, cold, tired, whether you're on a ridge, you're in a tree stand. These are the guys that have to be in position to make the shots for the dog hunt. Once the standards are in place, it's time for the doggers to enter the woods. Usually uh, follow along a deer trail if you can, because at the end of live tracks, there's usually live deer. So usually you can follow along those moving along through the bush. And um, hopefully you come to that. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's not that easy to be a dogger. And you have to push your way through the bush with no live tracks. You never know what's on the other side. But that's the dogger's job, to push through and try and get the deer moving out into the guys in their stance. Like I said, it's not an easy job sometimes, but if there's nothing better, is to hear the shots from out in the fields. It is important for the standers to be ready because you never know as a stander when you're going to get your opportunity. In this case here, out comes one. Concentrating on that, and here comes another one. Oh, standing shots. There go a couple more. That's the beauty of the shotgun hunt. You never know when it's going to happen or what it's going to happen, but it's going to be busy when it does. Now that the deer hunt is over, the hard work is just beginning. The deer must be field dressed and hung as soon as possible to prevent spoilage. Depending upon the outside temperature, meat may be brought to a butcher, or many groups bone and butcher the deer themselves. Storage temperature outside should not exceed 10 degrees Celsius for a long, prolonged period. Likewise, colder temperatures may make self-butchering more difficult. Make sure you have found a butcher prior to shooting a deer to ensure no waste. Most butchers will cut into steaks, roasts, and some will also make into sausage and pepperettes. It is all very good meat in the long run. Let's go visit Carlin in the kitchen and see what he's got cooking up today. Welcome back to the Real Outdoor Experience. Carlin here. I'm going to cook some venison roast today. Actually, it's venison backstrap, which is a really nice piece of meat. It comes uh, either side of the spine on the animal, and it's very tender. It's uh, similar to tenderloin. You don't have to use a whole lot of flavor on the backstrap, but I really love the flavor. So we're going to use some onion soup mix, some uh, mushroom soup in a can, and uh, a couple other flavors like Worcestershire sauce and soy sauce. Uh, coupled with uh, some, some real onion and some uh, fresh garlic, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to put all that in the slow cooker once we're done and just let it cook and simmer away for a couple hours. And it depends on the, uh, the amount of uh, deer you have, the amount of roast, the size of the roast, uh, as for cooking times. So the next step in this is just to simply put the salt and pepper on the roast. So I have some salt here, just sprinkle it on both sides and I'm going to take my pepper and grind it on and it's all about taste if you like a lot of pepper put a lot of pepper if you don't then you don't simple as that ok 
Okay, beautiful. The next step is to put this in the slow cooker. I like these small roasts because they don't take very long to cook. I have my uh, combination soya sauce and Worcestershire sauce in here. I'm just going to put that on, just drizzle it over top of the roast. And uh, beautiful, make sure it gets all over the roast. Okay, now I'm going to chop my uh, fresh garlic. And you can uh, put it in a garlic press and chop it up however you like. Uh, I like to uh, just make big chunks out of it. Keep it real simple. Again, sharp knife is key for this kind of an operation. Okay, I'm just going to put that in my hand and kind of distribute it equally. Yeah. Next step is I'm going to take my onion here and just chop it into rings. I like the rings just because it's simple and uh, you can distribute them all over the meat. Oh, I'm losing one there. You get lots of flavor from the onion. The next, I'm going to take my onion soup mix. It's a dry mix. Put it in a bowl. I'm going to take my mushroom soup mix and take it out of the can. Nothing fancy. I'm just going to whisk it together. Until it's all mixed up. Next, I'm just going to lather that over top of the roast and uh, we'll start the slow cooking process. Now we have this mushroom soup and onion soup mix mixed together and we're going to take that and just simply pour it over top of the roast and the onions and the garlic that we have in our slow cooker here. Nice and easy. Oh, that looks delicious. And what that's going to do is the flavors from the onion soup mix and the mushroom soup mix are going to cook down into the meat and create a really nice flavor for our venison roast. And really it's that simple. Well, fast forward six hours later folks and this is what we ended up with. A beautiful venison backstrap roast. I threw in some potatoes and carrots and the sauces all mingled in there and combined and they made their own gravy. No more preparation. Open the lid to the slow cooker and away you go. Let's give it a try here. Mmm, it's fantastic. That's all from Carlin from The Real Outdoor Experience. Keeping it real. Thank you for watching The Real Outdoor Experience. Keep it real.